Good morning, everybody. If we can take our seats, we're about to get started on this side's uh, content track. So our first speaker today is Luke Sneeringer. He works on API, there we go. API governance and API tools at Google, and he's going to talk to us about enacting standards. So give him a very warm round of applause, guys. Hello, everyone. It is good to be back in Austin. I am a 34-year native who is currently displaced. Uh, so we're going to talk about enacting standards. So last year, uh, Boyd Hemphill, who is one of the organizers of this conference, reached out to me and said, hey, would you come be willing to keynote? And I said, sure, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, pick a thing. And I thought about what I was doing at the time. And we were just about to take a complicated system that we had built and try to wrap it in Docker. Um, and so this was January or so, and I said, sure, I'd be happy to come. And, and I'll talk about, gave a couple sentence description of what I was doing and what I planned to talk about. And he said, OK. And life happened over the course of that time. And I had determined that I was working on the wrong thing. And I flew to Austin. And I'm about to give this talk, and I realized that not only have I completely changed everything I'm doing, but I don't actually know anything about the thing I was going to talk about. And so I'm, I'm sitting in a room, and I'm looking over my slides, and I realize that they all suck. And that I needed to do something else. And I ended up giving a talk last year called In Praise of Standards, whereby I said a couple of things. But it boiled down to this idea that the thing that I was working on had a problem. And the problem was that we had repeatedly sacrificed standards on the altar of convenience. We actually had a standard. We had built a thing around that standard. And none of the things that we built on top of it were documented or standardized themselves. And that the solution was that we needed to improve the standards where necessary. This is actually a slide from my talk last year. And at the end, it said, improve the standards where necessary, even when it is hard. And then I had a couple of more. Um, I made this claim that there is only one way to achieve simplicity when orchestrating a complex and diverse system, which is standards. And I had some rules around them. Um, make the simple case easy and the advanced case possible and then a bunch of ideas around enacting standards. The, the issue there was these were handways. I hadn't actually done that yet. Or I had done it, but I had, only I had only started doing it. So this talk is about what happened when I went to go take my own advice. Um, this is about my more or less one year journey to write a standard, document a standard, implement a standard, and fundamentally enact a standard in a large organization, and what happened. So let's go back to the starting line. We're now back in 2018. We're going to track our progress with the little calendar at the bottom right-hand corner here, and we're going to kind of see what happened. So starting line, we had one common system that we had built on top of. It worked with three proprietary ad hoc systems that didn't work very well. So what are my goals? Well, one goal is I need to convince my team that we should stop what we're doing and dig ourselves out of technical debt. Because normally, when you go to your manager and say, hey, I want to spend a bunch of time on a refactor, the thing that you get is usually justified suspicion. Are we really going to tell everyone that we're not going to implement any more features for the next six months because we want to go refactor our stuff? Um, then we had to go do the refactor. And that refactor involved two components, configuration and systems. Configuration being more or less our data model, and systems being our code. A rule that I have started to repeat often at work is that it is drastically easier to iterate on your code than your data model. And so it's much more important to get your data model right. And I gave a time estimate. I said I thought it would take about two-ish months to get the configuration altered and approved, and about three months to write the systems. 
Spoiler alert, that time estimate is wrong. Could not have been more wronger. Okay, so what steps did I take? Well, the first thing I needed to do was I needed to get buy-in, so I went to the person in charge of all of API design at Google, and I said, JJ, what, who do I need to get to sign off on this thing? And he gave me a list of three people. I added to that two people on a customer team and two people on our team, and I had a list of seven approvers. As a side effect, I ended up joining the API design team, and now I'm more or less the operations guy and, and uh, generally administer the API design program. That was an accidental side effect of this project, <laughs> and now it takes half of my time. Um, then I went and wrote a document. The document that I wrote was essentially a specification of what I thought our new configuration should be. I took all the configuration that we had, I figured out what I wanted to throw away, I figured out what we, I thought we could simplify, um, and, and I wrote a very detailed spec that, that uh, addressed all of this and exactly how it would work. It didn't do any work yet on code. This is all work on our, our config, which is effectively our data model. And that document was 14 pages. Um, we'll note, I'm going to be giving you page counts. All page counts are the length of the document now. So some of it might have been 12 pages at the time it grew. Um, now, of course, a 14-page document at Google is called a one-pager. In fact, every document at Google is called a one-pager. I'm not kidding. It's really a thing. Someone tried to explain it to me. I, it doesn't make sense. But anyway, we'll move on. So the next thing I did was I wrote a proof of concept implementation. It generated API clients in Python, and it was 500 statements. And I took it to my manager, and he said, wow, that's a lot smaller. This seems like it'll be a lot easier to do. It turns out that we went and checked our, our existing work, and I had taken 50,000 lines of Java and done the same thing in five, or almost the same thing in 500 lines of Python. And so now we're encouraged. We think that this is a pretty good idea. Um, it vendored in stuff from the proposed standard that I had sort of hacked together on the side. So now we have a spec, and we have an Im a proof of concept implementation of the spec. And, it, and you know, we keep going. Worth noting, we're now at the end of April of 2018. So this is what I had when I came on stage last year on May the 2nd and said that this is how I thought standards should work. Okay, so now, now I've come to Austin, um, and then I went from there to PyCon and some other stuff, and I've come back, and I'm back in California, and we're having a discussion about uh, the implementation. Um, essentially, there's one big question. In the original system, we had one large implementation, and our system was implementation-driven, rather than being spec-driven. In other words, our spec was whatever our tool did. Um, one of the things that I had proposed was that instead of having one monolithic tool that did this for every language we wanted to support, that added actually quite a bit of complexity. And I said, instead of doing this one time, we should do it seven times, but with focused, you know, focused individual tools that all adhere to the same specification. And that, that will also be the thing that keeps the specification honest. Uh, my, uh, one of my coworkers didn't agree with me, and so um, in true autistic fashion, we said, okay, we'll sit down and we'll write an adversarial collaboration. Uh, meaning we'll write a document that spells out as clearly as we can why each of us think that we are right and the other is wrong. This sounds like a really, really terrible thing to do, and it worked shockingly well. Um, and that has a lot to do with who that person was. Uh, and the fact that we were actually very willing to just say, this is what we disagree about. Here's the common ground that we found. One of the things that we found in common ground in doing this was that we both agreed that the configuration was broken. So we disagreed on the implementation, but we agreed on the data model. And data model being more important than the code, that sounds like a good thing. So now keeping track of our artifacts, we've got a couple documents and a proof of concept. So we took that to boss. And the boss looked at the spec and said, this reads like a spec. And I said, that's because it is a spec. <laughs> he wasn't thrilled about that. 
So he said he wanted examples. So we wrote an example document. And then we started, uh, you know, we had people getting in a room, iterating on the specification. The goal at this point is we have people working on this thing, and we want to agree on what the format of the specification is going to be. We iterate for about a month. And about once a week, I would make sure that the, you know, the implementation matched wherever the deliberations were going. Around here, we had a really interesting insight. Um, so I haven't actually said much about what this configuration is fundamentally about. But it was about auto-generating API clients from a description or a specification of that API. And we had a key insight when we were iterating, which is that an effective configuration should represent the structure and relationships. It should declare what the API is, not what the desired behavior for our tool was. And there were a couple of reasons for that, but the big one was that the things that we created would be usable by others. And it would minimize duplicate work that we did with other people. So we have more rounds of, of iteration. We decide that there's a couple more things that we're not going to do. Um, you know, another month goes by, we have an issue that ends up being a big problem, which is the way that Google does resource names. Um, and so we write a document around that. And then, huzzah, the configuration's approved. So I originally had a list of seven people that we had determined needed to approve this in order to enact it. And all seven of them have said, yes, we're happy with this. Now, we still have a couple problems. One of them is that even though we've agreed on our data model, we haven't agreed on some aspects of the implementation. But you know what? That's not actually a problem in a way that blocks work. So in order to move forward, I say I will go write a specification of the implementation. So I now have a config spec and an implementation spec. Or in other words, I have, if you're an API producer, here's how you go define your API. And if you're writing a generator, here's how you go write a generator. This is a valuable thing to have, even if we're not going to, to refactor into multiple generators, because we still need the one that we have to conform to this specification. So I go and write that. And we're about two months in, worth noting. So we started this. We were in early April. I said, you know, I think the configuration is going to take two months. It's been about two months. We've gotten approval. I'm feeling pretty good, right? Hands up everyone who's ever given a, uh, everyone who's ever given a time estimate that actually turned out to be remotely correct. Yeah, I, I, I would love to hire you. I don't usually do that. Usually my time estimates are off. That's not something that I have historically been particularly good at. So I feel great. I said it would take two months. Took two months. Awesome. Configuration, done. Implementation, time to code. At least we're going to you know, work on the thing that we agree on. So now it's time to go work on this. So I make the new configuration available on a branch, because as we code, we might find some problems I missed. You know, so I'm, I'm thinking of this as more or less being in, in release candidate state. Um, so I'm going to make that configuration available on a branch, because we might find issues. Um, and then I create, uh, I'm going to call them pull requests. That's not what we call them internally. But uh, in our internal monolithic repository, I create, they're called change lists there, but I create basically PRs to officially submit the config. Now I get to a couple of problems. Um, and also, there's a team member who's very passionate about the implementation debate and decides he's going to go write a proof of concept Go implementation. So now I have a branch with the config in GitHub. I have two implementations, one in Python and one in Go. And I've got some supporting documentation. And I hit a problem. It turns out none of the seven people who we agreed are the approvers for this actually have the authority in the repository to tell me that I can submit the code. So I go back to the person who was doing this originally and said, hey, I need help. And you know, what do I do? And so he tells me who to negotiate with, and I tell the team to go ahead. And this is where things start going very wrong. So first, we have some, some on-team issues. 
we, uh, you know, again, we're still deciding whether to write one large implementation or seven small ones. And uh, it, everyone's getting together once every three months, and we decide what we're going to do. We're going to write seven small ones. And it's a pretty convincing vote. So now we have small ones. Uh, we have now six separate generators, all of which are conforming to the spec. That's great. There's only one problem. We're still negotiating the spec. <laughs> so now what we have is we have a spec that we think is approved, but it's not really approved and it's actually in flux. And we have six plus people going and implementing that spec as it is. On the, on the you know, team, on the people that are going and implementing this, we find a new problem, which is we don't have a credible testing plan for these things. So we go and write one. That's actually surprisingly easy. It turns out that having a spec makes it much easier to have a credible testing plan. So I'm going through. I'm negotiating configuration changes. Um, so I'm not really notice, noting how much time has gone past, but this is a four-month period. So we're now at Christmas. And the reason why this has been stuck for four months is because it turns out that the person that I have to negotiate with is um, very busy, very high level, tends to uh, not be able to go to meetings at the last minute. And so you have a team thrashing because we're trying to build our data model as we're flying the, you know, as we're building the implementation, which is more or less building the plane as you're flying it. Um, we get some of the negotiations squared away over the course of four months, and it turns out that in the process of doing that, I needed to make some compromises, which is completely reasonable, and so I need to give my team some breaking changes. That means that all of these need to be updated to make appropriate edits. And I go to my team and I say, team, what do you want me to do about this? I've got 60% of it approved. I am still working on the other 40%. I can give you breaking changes now and then give you fewer breaking changes later, or I can hold them and give them to you all in one lump sum when we're done. Who would vote for the, uh, the, the breaking changes as we go? About half the room, who would vote for the one lump sum? About a quarter of the room. Well, the software engineers voted for one lump sum. Clearly, the SREs would have voted for the incremental thing. Um, so the, they voted for the one lump sum, so that's what we decided to do. Um, in the meantime, we've written our testing tool, and we found a couple of issues that you know, with the data model that didn't quite work. It's in the part that's not approved yet, so we, we, we go and do that work. Okay, so we're still in a holding pattern. Turns out it's still hard to get meetings. Um, we now have two more implementations. So we're now at eight, including two languages we didn't support before because people are excited. And configuration is our blocking issue. So at the beginning of this talk, I said your data model is more important than your code, but now I haven't like held up that standard because I've got a data model that's in flux and I've let a bunch of people go write a bunch of code, including some contractors. Um, in theory, there's only one component left under discussion. Um, we, at this point, decide that we've gone too long. We, you know, so we decided that the people that voted for the incremental breaking changes were right and we were wrong. Um, so we go in and Everyone goes in and updates back to the all but one thing that's, that's fixed. I went and wrote a migration guide. Notice uh, I haven't been calling much attention to it, but our, our list of like documents that people have had to write around this are starting to pile up. Um, I do a okay but not spectacular job of keeping the ones down here updated because it turns out when you write documents in June and it's now February of the next year, you may not have been perfect at going and updating all of them that in many cases repeat the same information. Um, and I've got uh, about 45 pages worth of one pagers. So it's actually hard to keep that all in track. Um, the, ads group, the ads team comes to us and says that they want to use our work 
Uh, and so we generate another branch for them so that they can annotate appropriately. So now we've got you know, three branches going on, one with the original work, one with the updated work, because they need to move from here to here, and a separate one for ads that I don't know why is actually separate other than somebody else did it. So this is our state. So I'm trying to enact a standard, and what I've done is I've created chaos. The goal is, the goal of a standard is that it's the only way to reduce chaos out of a distributed organization. And what we have is we have an in-progress standard that we've all implemented. So I've done the opposite of what I'm trying to do. Now I have, I had one implementation that we couldn't keep up. Now I have eight implementations and a standard that's moving underneath them. This is not a good place to be. Oddly enough, my team is shockingly OK with it. Um, I'm beating myself up, and everyone else is telling me how great of a job I'm doing. Uh, that's not a great feeling either. But this is where we are. Um, and again, we're, we've now gone nine months from when I stood up here last year and said, improve your standards even if it's hard. And I'm looking at this going, turns out it's really, really, really hard. We have more configuration concerns. Um, basically, the way that we declare what the objects and APIs are is complicated. Because at the same time as we're trying to do this work for our client libraries, another team is trying to do this work for IAM permissions. And another team is trying to do this because we want to build a system that will make a lot of GCP APIs available over Kubernetes, and Kubernetes needs to be able to know about certain relationships. And so we want to have a single thing that will fit all of these use cases. So we go back, we renegotiate this with these other teams, which is actually a good thing, but it also means we're moving our standard underneath us again. And finally, it's done. I should have had the meme of, Sam saying it's over, Mr. Frodo. Um, so it's now April 21st, Easter Sunday, two, a week and a half ago. This talk was accepted before this happened. I was not sure that I would be able to have this slide. Um, but I finally have gotten enough buy-in on configuring resources, and I've gotten everything submitted for real and standardized. Um, I would really love to figure out how to take that list of people that I had to get to sign off on it and make it into some, some riff on the 12 days of Christmas. Um, but I, I ultimately had to get approval from four senior engineers, five staff engineers, three senior staff engineers, and a tech writer. In case you're wondering, Google has a rule that you're supposed to never have more than three or four approvers for a project. <laughs> we, uh, we overshot that. The final agreement uh, made someone in haste notice it was submitted on a Sunday. April 21st was Easter. Uh, have more breaking changes, including to some of the things that we thought were sacrosanct. And so now we are in the process of migrating these guys again to the new thing that actually is sacrosanct, I really, really, really hope. And so now we're at today. I had told you my story. Some things worked well, some things didn't. I'm going to go over what worked well and what worked didn't in a minute. Um, but now we're, we're doing what we believe is our final refactor. The way that we're doing it, we have our old configuration, our new configuration. We're making something called the skinny config, which is essentially the difference between the two. So everything that we didn't migrate, we're still able to keep in a side file for now so that we can you know, do a migration in place. And I'm in the process of writing even more documents, migrating existing APIs, and then, and then you know, declaring these beta and then very quickly stable. OK, so you've heard my story. What went well? Well, something, oh, several things did work really well. One was that even though it took a lot of negotiation to get a standard through, and even though it took a year to do something that I thought would take 12 months, at every given point, the standards were actually very simple and very, very easy to understand. 
this proliferation of implementations happened in part because everyone could look at the thing and understand them and know what, it, know what they needed to do. A thing that I didn't really call attention to is that I wrote this one, but I didn't have anything to do with any of these. I wasn't a code reviewer. I, wa I wasn't a reviewer to make sure that they had uh, followed the spec correctly. We had a testing tool for that. Um, in fact, I had nothing to do with any of these other blue boxes on the screen. So one thing that went well was that having standards allowed us, even moving standards, just having something allowed us to make implementations that we could be more confident in. And in fact, having those standards reified and written down helped us at every single step. Um, at some point, we realized that we didn't have anyone with Ruby expertise. But one of our partner teams had um, you know, Ruby contractors that were just amazing at Ruby and wanted to do this. So we just said, sure, here's a document. Go forth. I never talked to the people. Uh, and, and neither did almost anybody else. Standards also enabled testing. Because we had standards, we had something against which to write a testing tool where we could look at all of these and be confident that they were correct and that they completed all the required aspects. And it allowed the team to scale horizontally. And what, here's what I mean by that. Again, seven people, actually a little more, nine or 10 people, were able to go and work on implementations without having to constantly come back to me, who is traveling half the time and otherwise very busy, to ask how to do particular things. Documented standards allowed our team to scale horizontally where before we had choke points. Before we had communication things where only one person knew how various different things worked. And now we have everyone able to go serve themselves when they need information. Um, because yeah, we had a lot of documents, but we had an index of them and people could go find what they needed. Um, another thing that went well was, was the people working around me were incredibly supportive. In fact, probably more supportive than was deserved. Um, the last thing that went well was the standards actually worked. Um, like engineers would come and say like, I know what's going on. I didn't know what was going on before and I know what's going on now. We increased our bus factor from more or less zero, as in we were already in the situation where someone had been hit by a bus, not literally, and we didn't know what we were doing, to being to a point where every single individual person knew how almost the entire system worked. Um, another thing that went well was that it, it gave people that weren't us a desire, you know, if they were interested in some kind of esoteric environment or esoteric language, we were able to give this to them and say, here, you can go make this. We're, we're not going to serve this use case because it's not important enough and we're not funded for it. But if you want it, you can go do it. We think it'll take you about a month and here you go. And in, and in fact, that has started to happen. So Dart isn't on this list yet, but the uh, actual Dart team at Google has started doing this. And also, the standard was usable for other purposes. Now the fun part, what went poorly? Well, approvals, we went through that. Seven approvers ballooned to 13. Slightly more than the three to four you're supposed to get. Logical order. Implementing a standard that you think is approved only to have it change underneath you is very frustrating. I will leave it as an exercise to the audience to decide which is worse, not having a standard at all or having a standard that doesn't end up actually being the standard. Some things are worse about each one. Like in some ways, at least you had, you know, you can kind of version control it, you can kind of see what changed. So there are things about it that worked um, and that were, more, that were better. But at the same time, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't instill confidence among people when you go to them and say, you know, and, and this is me, I did this. When I, can, when I go to someone and say, you can go implement this, it's decided, and then I have to go back to them later and say, uh, uh, s s sorry about that, someone else uh, forced, forced renegotiation. Um, and the last thing that didn't work is very obviously the clock. Um, that whole thing where it was going to take two months to get standards and it took a year. Um, and even then, it only landed two weeks ago, so I can't tell you for, with 100% confidence that worked really poorly, although we are actually pretty confident. So some, a couple of final takeaways. 
The mythical man month is real. Many, many, many of the issues that we had were around communication. They were around the fact that we needed to talk to a lot of different people and that those people were hard to schedule and so on and so forth. And the more people that we added to this equation, the more difficult all of this got. So something, a big takeaway that you should learn is that the mythical man month is a real thing. However, standards are a way to ameliorate that because standards enable self-service. Um, uh, Darren, I think his name was, and I really, really apologize if I got it wrong, um, stood up in his keynote and was talking about how in, in DevOps, enabling self-service was what allows SREs to scale. This is true for the same thing for an infrastructure team. Was it worth it? Yes. It mostly was worth it um, for the reasons I've already described. Now, it's worth noting that I, I originally set out to code myself out of a job. I failed to do that. Um, I, I'm not doing what I was doing before, but the process of doing this gave me a, a large number of new responsibilities. And so let's revisit this slide. I put this slide up at the end of my talk last year. What, what went, uh, how is it held up? Actually, it's held up pretty well. Um, you know, th these general principles at, uh, at, at the top, I, I more or less followed, and they served me very well. Uh, here's my diff. I said before, take the time to document the standard. Don't, uh, don't underestimate the importance of getting it approved, because an unapproved standard isn't worth the paper that it's written on. And largely, everything else Everything else has largely held up one year later. I'm, I'm still pretty happy with what I said. Um, you know, it was hard. It did take a lot of time and a lot of effort, and some of that effort isn't going to pay off for another six months after this stuff is migrated. But the effort is still valuable because it's what allows self-service, it's what allows understandability, and it's what's going to allow us to move forward. So these standards for standards, have largely worked for me over the last year, and I still recommend them to you as a useful mode of thinking. And that's all I got. Do I have time for questions? I am told by our MC that I do have time for questions. So question, if I was going to do it again, would I not write any code until I had all my approvals? I would write a lot less of it. Um, that, that first, th this first proof of concept implementation, we couldn't have gotten it right. Like the approval wouldn't have been worth anything at that point because I would have found, the I would have found mistakes in what I was doing when I coded the first one. So here, this was a good thing. This wasn't. Um, maybe even having a couple, like, the, the second one, we probably caught a couple things, um, but the, the farther up it went, the, the, the more that didn't work out very well. I think I have time for one more question, based on the one minute flag I just got. One more yes. question? Uh, if, you've got, if you've got a team of people waiting to go to work on this, but you're working the standards process, how do you keep that team engaged to where they don't move on to other work, stay interested? If you could do it over again, could you sick them on seeking approvals, things like that? Yeah, so the question is, how do you, how do you keep the team busy? Um, so it turned out that we had so much toil that that didn't end up being a problem. In fact, it ended up being a problem for me more than the rest of the team because my major job is getting the standards through. I'm stuck, so I took on other work. So the reason why I now administer the API governance program at Google is because I was bored waiting for approvals. <laughs> and so started going and doing something else. Uh, and, and so, of course, now I have lots of work to do with my, with my standard approved. Um, so it turned out that we had so much toilet that that was surprisingly not a problem. Uh, if I had to do it over again, if I had to do over again, I think um, the thing that I would do is I would nag more, actually. Um, the, the, like, 
I, I have a really, really hard time with, with social questions, and it was really hard, like, if someone canceled a meeting, and they say, well, I can't meet with you for another three weeks. You know, at some point, I think the big thing that I should have done differently there is I should have said, 12 people are waiting on you. <laughs> like, you know, either take this seriously, get out of the way, or block it so that we can go do something else. That's the thing that I really should have done differently there. And I believe that I am out of time. Pause.